Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Keith Yedlin. I'm a product unit manager uh, in the Manicore team over in Visual Studio. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Michael Chu. He's currently a member of the um, Compiler Creating Custom Processors Research Group uh, at the Electrical Engineering Computer Science Department of the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Mike's going to be talking with us today about cooperative data and computation partitioning for distributed applications. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike and welcome very, very much and good luck. Hey. Thanks, Keith, and thanks, everyone, for coming. So as you said, I'm talking about cooperative, my thesis work on cooperative data and computation partitioning for distributed architectures. So as I'm sure you're all very well aware, multi-core is the future for processor design systems. So this is largely in response to the fact that aggressively scaling the clock frequency of these single monolithic processor designs uh, simply has too many problems in terms of power consumption. And we already have a lot of these processors from Intel, AMD, and Sun, and IBM with two, four, and eight cores. And the general idea that we've, general thing we've been seeing is that we're decreasing the individual core complexity, but increasing the number of cores. So what this means in terms of performance is that these processors ha can support a significant, a large amount of throughput. So, but as far as the application goes, in the past we've generally been able to assume a programmer can write an application and future generations of processors will execute that application faster. But what this means now is that it won't, that's not necessarily true. And with more, what the programmer has to do, the programmer and the compiler I should say, is to exploit the underlying parallelism within the applications and allow the hardware to execute those programs faster. So, as I said, we already have processors with two cores and four cores, and we're going to see more and more in the future. So, if we take a look at the architecture and the programming language and the compiler uh, research areas right now, you'll see a lot of work on what I consider coarse grain parallelism. Now, coarse grain parallelism are things like new programming models like transactional memory, things like uh, different ways to do threading, and things like streams and data level parallelism, like a lot of what NVIDIA and ATI are doing on their graphics, card, gra graphics chips. Now, I consider these coarse grain because what they're trying to do is ask the programmer to identify these large chunks of the program. So here you have a data flow graph. And you'll say, this can execute in parallel. And what they'll do is, say, here we can replicate this and spread it across the cores. So this is a, a fantastic way to parallelize our applications. And I'm not arguing that at all. But I'm going to be talking about a slightly different perspective today. So I'm going to attack a different form of parallelism, which I call fine-grained parallelism. And to do that, I'm going to leverage some other work going on within the multi-core processor design space right now. And that's looking at this interconnect. So right now, most of these multi-core processors transfer scalar values through memory, which is a slow process. But there's been a lot of work recently on how we can take this, take this communication between the cores and make it faster, increasing the bandwidth and increasing how fast we can transfer values between the cores. So what this will allow us to do is to take, let's look at this single thread and look at ways in which we can break that single thread up and form these fine-grained threads and partition those up across the cores. So the important thing here, uh, to know here is that what I'm talking about, it's not an either-or situation of either coarse grain or fine grain. What I'm talking about is, think about this as in a partitioning in different dimensions. In one dimension, we can parallelize at the coarse grain, 
and with our remaining cores, we can still get further performance benefit by uh, exploiting par parallelism at the fine grain level. So, if we look at just this problem of taking this data flow graph, finding out where we can partition it, and spread it across these cores, you'll see what we have here is a very similar problem to some things we've done in the compiler before. And that's because, in many ways, multi-core is also the past. So if we look at the embedded design space, so these are processors that are going in our cell phones and our cars and our presentation remotes. These things have lower power constraints and higher performance requirements. And they hit a lot of the same design decisions many, many years ago. So what, you, what they started with was a processor like you see here on the right. In order to meet their performance requirements, they made a more sophisticated core. They increased the number of resources, the functional units in, in this processor, and they increased the register file size and so forth. But what they found was that this design had some faults as far as the register file is concerned. The register file became a very slow uh, access, had a very slow access latency because of all of these ports from the functional unit going to the register file. Their solution? To go to this, what they called a multi-cluster design. So in a multi-cluster design, they have individual register files connected to subsets of the functional units, and they connect through this fast transfer of scalar values through this interconnect cluster connect communication network. So what you see here is they still have all the parallelism that they did before, but in the compiler they have to deal with the fact that to transfer uh, scalar values between these clusters, they have some non-zero latency to move the values. So this whole, oh, uh, on the bottom here you see there's already a lot of examples of processors way back as far as 1992 of these multi-cluster type designs. So this whole notion between the differences of multi-cluster and multi-core is largely a semantic issue at this point. Um, for the rest of this talk, actually, I'm going to use the terms clusters and cores interchangeably. The one distinction I would like to make is, generally, when we think of a multi-cluster system, we think of a system like this. When we think of a multi-core, we don't generally have a shared data memory like we see here. And we could think of more a case like this where we have distributed data memories and some coherence network to keep those caches coherent. So when we think of a multi-core, it's a little bit trickier as far as how we're going to take go from the compiler and take the code and separate them across these different clusters or cores. So for the rest of the talk, this is the actual type of architecture that I'm going to be targeting. So the overall objectives of this work, the goal is to detect and exploit fine-grained parallelism. What that means is, given some data flow graph, like you have here on the slide, I need to look at all of the operations, figure out which of these clusters am I going to execute these operations on, and how, how I'm going to create the threads that way. But another tricky thing is I need to understand, for each of the memory operations, when I go and assign them to a certain cluster or core, I'm, in essence, assigning the data that they're accessing to a certain cache. So I have to, be, I have to understand this, or else I'm going to have a significant number of memory stalls when I'm executing my program. So the key, a key point here is that the compiler is a really good place to make this happen. We could let this happen at the programming model level, but we're already having trouble at, at that level of uh, programmers are having trouble grasping their mind around paralyzing a program at a core screen level. If we bring it down all the way down to this fine grain level, that's going to be very difficult. But the compiler has the understanding of the underlying hardware and how things are going to be executed. So it's a great place to make this happen. So here you see a very high level framework of how my system works. It's a phase order uh, system where at the first level, we're going to take the program and figure out a partitioning of the data. Let's look at how the data is accessed in the program and divide it up across the different caches. At the bottom level here, we'll see at a region-by-region region level, we're going to look at each of the regions of the code. These are 
basic blocks of the code. And at this whole block level, let's divide up the operations across the different cores and form these fine-grained threads. So as you can, well, this partition of the computation, generally we'd like to do it at the global level too, like we are with the data. Data makes sense because data kind of lives at the global level. And if we could partition the computation at the global level, that'd be great. But that's simply a very difficult problem, so we restricted it more to a block level. So first, I'm going to ignore this problem of computation partitioning. And this looks strictly at partitioning the data. We'll come back to computation partitioning later on. So let's look at data partitioning for caches. The goal here is overall we want to maximize how much parallel computation we can do. And here we're focusing on reducing stall cycles. We're going to do this in two ways. One is that we're going to try to reduce the amount of coherence traffic going through this coherence network. The second thing is reducing the number of conflicts and misses within the caches. Now, there's two different ways we could go about doing this. And one way is, which I'm not going to get into the details about today, but this one, one thing that I did was a static analysis method. So statically in the compiler, we can look at all of the memory operations. And we know we can statically determine which objects in the program each memory operation is touching. And we can partition up those objects across the caches at that level of an object. So this is great in terms of coherence, because you're not going to get any coherence traffic. An entire object is, in, is essentially assigned to a certain cache. So you're not getting, but the problem is you're also not getting any sharing of data. So if a program is only reading out of a large array, you're assigning that entire array into one cache when you could put it in both caches and get more parallel work. Um, so what we found here is the problem with static analysis is this object granularity. And it works well in, for this paper I, I worked on here is working more on a local memory or a scratch pad memory, if you're familiar with that. And it works well in that case. But when we moved more towards the caches, we saw we were left leaving a lot of uh, performance on the table by not sharing data. So what I'm talking about is more, some of my more recent work now on profile-driven partitioning, where we have a finer granularity of looking at individual memory instructions. So to do this, what I'm going to do is build up what I call a memory access graph. So we have the data flow graph for our entire program. And we have nodes which indicate individual operations in our program. Here I've indicated the red operations are our loads and stores, and yellows are everything else. So for this memory access graph, what we're going to do is ignore everything except the memory operations. And we're going to, these, so every node in our graph here is a memory instruction. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to build up relationships between these memory operations see when they want to be in the same cache together, and when they want to be apart. So I'll get into the specifics in the, in the next two slides, but the node weight is going to estimate the working set size of an individual operation, and the edges will indicate some affinity between those operations. And we'll build up some graph to partition. So let's look at each of these individually now. Node weight. As I said, node weight estimates the working set size. So what I'm going to do here is look at a profile of the application. And given a certain load, what address is it accessing? I'll trace back through the profile to see when was the last time that's the same load accessed that same address. And what we can look is to see is how many unique cache blocks would have been brought into the cache in the meantime. So if you're familiar with the uh, idea of reuse distance, this is basically what a reuse distance is. So what this tells us is, uh, for, for this load one, if we had a fully associative cache, we would need at least five cache blocks to have that hit again. So this gives us an idea of how long a certain memory instruction wants to be in the cache. And what we do is we take a weighted average of the blocks required for every uh, memory instruction. Intuitively, what you can think about is if two memory operations have a very large uh, working set estimate, they're both going to want to stay in the cache for a long time. 
and we're generally going to try to want to push them to separate caches because they want to stay, stay, stay in for a long time. So the other important thing here is the edge weight. And as I said earlier, the edge weight is going to find relationships between memory operations. And uh, we're going to come up with a positive affinity and a negative affinity between operations. So what we do here is we have a profile, again, the same type of profile, and we have a sliding window that we're trying to trace through uh, the program. So we'll look at a certain memory operation. Here we have load 4 as our current memory access to block 4. We'll trace back through this sliding window and see that here's another load, a load 2, which also accessed that block 4. So what we do in this case is we increase the positive affinity between load 4 and load 2 because essentially if load 2 was in a certain cache, load 4 would have uh, most likely hit. Similarly, we're going to keep tracing back and we'll see here's a store 1 to block 4 and again, we'll increase our positive affinity. And we actually terminate at this point. What you'll notice is there actually is a load 3 at the very end of the sliding window that also accesses the same block. We don't increase the positive affinity here. Um, essentially, we stop our trace back through on two cases. One, we hit the end of the sliding window. And two, we hit a store to that block. So intuitively, you can think of, if you hit a store to a block, coherency-wise, you're going to bring that block into ownership state and you're going to invalidate that, that, memory, that block in the other caches. So the fact that load 3 brought it into some cache is essentially irrelevant. So that's the positive affinity. We've, we, we, we've figured out uh, memory operations here that want to be together. So for the negative affinity, what we're doing is that we're doing a pseudo-cache simulation. And we're going to look at what cache line these blocks are mapping to. So what we'll see is that load 4 is actually accessing cache line 2. We can trace back through and see that here's a case where load 1 accessed cache line 2, but it was bringing in a different block. It was bringing in block 2. So here's a case where these two might con conflict in the cache and kick each other out. And here we would increase the negative affinity between these operations. And what we end up with is a graph like this. So inside each of these nodes, I've indicated the, uh, the working set estimate. So there, this is the average number of blocks required for these memory operations. And I've connected these operations together with some uh, affinity. So a green means positive affinity, and red means negative affinity. So what we want to do is prevent the overloading of these node weights. We don't want to have all these very heavy uh, large working set operations in one cluster, and we want to minimize when we're cutting positive affinity cuts. And if we have some highly negative ones, let's try to cut those there. So for this simplified example, it's very easy. We would cut here and form our partitions like so. We group these into separate caches at this point. So there's actually two problems involved here. As I said earlier, once we're partitioning the data and once one we're actually partitioning the, the computation. So for the time being, let's actually ignore the computation. But I'll show you later on how the rest of the computation gets partitioned. Um, but let's actually just focus purely on the memory. So for the experiment methodology, I use the Trimaran compiler toolset, which is a uh, research compiler, uh, which is currently being developed in our group. And I profiled and I ran with different inputs. I profiled with a small input set and ran it on the full. And for the machine models, I vary the uh, machine a lot with two to four clusters, with many different types of caches, and many different types of latencies for that move operation between the different clusters. So as I said before, yes. Were those real data flow graphs from real programs or just? Dedicated flow graphs that so the actual programs that I that ran? But the input sets. The input sets, generally, they were the test input sets. And then I ran on either the reference or on the reference type input sets. So um, they were much smaller sets, I guess. But were they real programs? Or yes. Can you, what, will you say which programs? Or? Yeah, next slide. So as I said earlier, 
um, we have these, the two, two main things I'm doing is trying to reduce the coherence and reduce the uh, memory stall time. So here you see all the different benchmarks. Here's a subset of the benchmarks that I ran. And what I tried to do is give you a good view of different characteristic type programs. So first we have these programs on the left which are purely kernel benchmarks. So these are a kernel loop. So these have extremely lo large amount of parallelism. So this is ideal for extracting fine grained parallelism. I also ran the media bench benchmarks. So these have slightly less amount of parallelism, but uh, they still have a good amount. And finally, I also ran some spec benchmarks here, which have very low amounts of parallelism. So these are not ideal for my, for, for my system. And what you'll see is that for the kernel benchmarks, I'm almost every case, oh, I'm sorry, the baseline for this case is the generic partitioning where we purely partition the computation assuming a shared memory. So we don't really understand the underlying uh, distributed caches. So what you can see here is that we reduce for the kernels up to 93, or 90, over, all over 90% of the coherence traffic. Media bench is also quite good. And even spec is, is uh, pretty good except for MCF. But 70% reduction in coherence traffic is not bad. <laughs> On average, what we see is we have about a 93% reduction in that coherence traffic. So that's just one, one issue. The other issue is how much are we actually saving in memory stall time. So here you see the same benchmarks. And how much reduction in the memory stall time on the, on the processor. So again, you'll see the same benchmarks on the kernels. Some of them, as like line screen there, is up to 90% reduction in how, many, how much time we're spent stalling, waiting for memory. Uh, the media bench, again, we have some benchmarks, G721 and GSM encodes and decodes, which all reduce the memory stall time a lot. And not surprisingly, with the specs, we didn't see a significant amount of reduction in memory stall time. They don't have a significant amount of parallelism for us to break up these data accesses. But on average, what you see is that we have three different averages, average bars uh, with one, two, and three cycle. These are the different uh, penalties for our moves in moving the operations, uh, moving the scalar values between the clusters. On average, you see we're about between 40 and 50 percent reduction in our memory stall time by intelligently placing the data into certain ca into caches together and localizing those memory op accesses. Um, you'll see, in general, we see the best case is four kilobytes in every cache. And this is generally because, as I said before, when we're doing this profile, I was assuming a 4K cache. So the characteristics that I was actually end up uh, using to make my decisions was a 4K cache, but I ended up using, running that on different cache configurations. But it didn't vary too much. And in many cases, it still did quite well. Sure. I assume that these benchmarks have widely different working sets and yes. data access counts, et cetera, et cetera. Is that factored into the average somehow, or is it just a raw average? This is a raw average, so yeah. So one thing you'll notice is that many of these benchmarks here, or only three of, three of the benchmarks actually had a little bit worse performance in uh, memory stall time. This is generally on the smaller caches. When you have smaller caches, uh, I was more limiting and I had trouble sometimes partitioning up the operations intelligently across such a small cache. But as we went to larger and larger caches, this problem improved. So this data partitioning. The general idea, I distributed data references across multiple caches. And I have a fine-grained control of all of my memory decisions. Generally, I'm going to improve stall cycles by up to 51%, or an average of 51%, and reduce the coherence traffic that I'm seeing by an average of 93%. So as I said earlier, this is really only half the problem. Can sure. we talk a little bit about the need for data partitioning? Uh, where, where, where are the, the decision points concerned? Where the, the coach mm -hmm. example, uh, 
So if I were at some point to say, uh, you know, I'm going to allocate this object now, and I'm going to work on pieces of data for that object. Mm -hmm. This is where you say um, the memory that I'm going to allocate is going to sit in that cache or in that cache, or, or is it just statically allocated? It's a statically allocated weight ahead of time. Okay. So, I think before everything that you're talking about. Okay. So that applies at this point to algorithms that basically have static data structures. It, it also works with dynamically allocated structures because what I'm doing is I'm only I'm using a profile of the code. So I actually have a have the program run and dump out a profile of all of the memory ad addresses and their associated address. Um, but I'm not actually looking. I don't worry about the specific addresses that they're accessing. I'm more trying to build up these relationships. Yes. So as long as certain loads will still uh, have some access to the same objects, the relationships will still bind no matter what they're actually allocated to. Right. So, that makes sense? Yes, except you need to establish these relationships such that when you do allocate these objects, they end up in the right caches and there are no conflicts. Mm -hmm. So, if my algorithm allocates object A and then object B, so your analysis decides that they need to be in different caches. You need to make some. So I actually, I actually do also um, allocate the memory allocation routine to a certain cache. So I kind of I skipped over that part, but yes, for simplification point. <laughs> Did you have a question? Or? Okay. Well, saying that all these uh, decisions are made for data processing at static analysis time, or I top that one that you said that you have to run the program too. So. I have one technique that works in the static analysis, but as I said, that's more of an object granularity. So here, what I've talked about here is we compile the code first, run it, and just to see what access, what, what these relationships are, and then go in partition it based on that. Do you know how that changes with different runs of the program? I mean, different inputs? So all of the sh things I showed you what were... What about indirect addressing in the... Uh, so everything I showed you was using different inputs. So yes, this generally did change. I mean, I have some room for error, obviously. You will see some slightly different relationships. But overall, what I saw is because I'm only looking at relationships, and I'm not purely looking at what accesses, what, what addresses things are accessing. In general, most of the cases, I was able to pull out, uh, pull out some pretty good relationship information. Okay. So how, how tolerant is this approach of um, uh, changing resource um, levels in, in your program? I mean, in a time-sharing environment, for example, right here, you might have 16 cores available to you for mm -hmm. execution at one point in the program, and then you know a second later, you only have four. So, so, so how do you adapt at runtime to that? I would say this is one. One of, that's a good question. This is one of the faults of my system. I'm more making a static analysis uh, decision. Um, this is more of an issue with the infrastructure that I've been using. It doesn't really allow for a situation like that. But ideally, what you'd like to do is more of a sampling situation and find out decisions like that. When you find cases like that and actually fine tune things at runtime. So a lot of this, I would say, maps better to the runtime situation than statically uh, making a decision on the, uh, the memory placement. To be adaptive, you would have to do videoing the. You would, you would have to repartition, be able to repartition mm -hmm. the data at runtime as you. Sure, yeah. um, okay. but I think if you look at how my, I'm doing my profile information, I'm only using a sliding window, window at a time. I don't care that I have the entire profile, and yes, I think you could get a lot of, a lot better information, especially because. So one thing that I'm missing, is that, I'm making a static decision for every memory operation, which cache it's going to go execute in. But a lot of programs do have some phase behavior. Some cases, there might be some strong relationship between operations. But much later on in the program, they might have very different. And in a runtime situation, I think you could capture that with my information. But in my, in my case here, I need to make a static decision. So sometimes that happens. OK. Up to this point, what I've talked about is purely data partitioning. We've taken our memory accesses and partitioned up to uh, the caches. But like I said, that's only half the story. 
Now we have to figure out, for all the rest of the operations in our program, how are we going to actually partition those up to create what I've called these fine-grained threads? So let's focus on this computation partitioning now. So as I said earlier on in this topic, this, this is something that's not totally new. The very, this is very similar to that multi-cluster compilation in the embedded world. The basic idea here is we're going to try to minimize the schedule length of our program. And the strategy is to exploit those underlying parallel resources that we have and minimize when we have critical intercluster communication. So given this large graph, let's focus on a little bit. If we have this critical path here, uh, going from that add to the bottom add, what we're going to want to do is not cut anything there, because that's the critical path, and parallelize work by moving those orange operations to another cluster, and insert some move. So as I said, there's a lot of been work that's been done on this in the past. but they all have some issues with them, and I'd like to focus on two of those issues right now. One is that a lot of these programs have this local scope versus region scope. So uh, most of the algorithms have a local scope, which means when you place an operation into one of these clusters or cores, you only have an idea of what has been previously placed. So, actually. So here, we start at operation 1, and we go down to 2, 6, and 10. We're going to place all of those on the same uh, cluster. This is the critical path. And then when we're at 10, we're going to start going back up. And we'll see that 3 and 7 can be paralyzed at the same time. And this inserts a move between 7 and 10, where we're going to transfer some scalar value. The problem is that we only have this local scope. We don't really know about the rest of the graph and how else we can parallelize it. And it'll go and continue parallelizing as so and show a graph that takes eight cycles to execute and has two moves of scalar values. Now, if I had a region scope, I could look at the entire block and, say, and realize I can get by with only one move between 11 and 12, and I can parallelize all that work on the, on the left side with all that work on the right side. So, Here's a much better partition. Well, it's, not, it's only one cycle difference, but as an example, you can see what the difference is. Yeah. Can you give a definition of what is local versus region scope? Okay. How would they embody themselves in like C++? So local scope, is, it's greedy. So it's a greedy algorithm. So basically, um, kind of like I just walked through here, you're going to you're going to go through each step, and you're going to locally, at that point, parallelize as much as you can. So when you, so you start on the critical path, and you're going to place operations into some cluster, looking at when the, where the communication is. And any time you can quickly gain parallelism by uh, spreading operations across, like 3 and 7 there, I'm going to go ahead and do that, because I don't know about the rest of the graph. Region, I have an idea of the whole code. So it's a better idea. So it's not a question of visibility to the graph. It's a question of the amount of analysis you would like to do to the graph. Or is it the question of the visibility? I say it's both. Both. Both okay. because you have, it's locally ones only have a very narrow visibility of the whole uh, data flow graph. And regions have a much bigger visibility. But you also have to do more analysis to understand this. So it's a factor of both. So. A second problem that a lot of these algorithms have is that they're all scheduler-centric. So there's two, two problems here. One, you're taking up a program and partitioning it up across these different clusters or cores. And two is that you're going to assign them to a certain schedule time. Um, so these are really highly inter interrelated. One is saying where you're going to execute, and one is saying when you're going to execute. And ideally, you'd like to consider these problems together to make a decision. Um, but the problem is that the scheduler is a slow process. And if you have a large data flow graph, and you're constantly trying new solutions to, uh, for a partition assignment of your operations, every, at every iteration, if you're trying to run the scheduler to figure out where, whether this is a better partition or not, that's a very slow process. So, what I tried to do in my work is an opposite approach to conventional scheduling. 
So what I'm going to do here is a hierarchical region view. We have a region view of the program, but we're going to try and group together operations that we know we want to consider as a single unit at, at, in, a hierarchy, in a hierarchy. We're not going to use the scheduler. Now, the scheduler would be great because it gives us an exact metric for the goodness of a current partition. Um, but as I said, it's a very slow process. So what I'm doing is I'm, I have an estimate on the schedule length, which can be calculated much faster. So the advantages here is that it's more efficient. I have this hierarchical notion, and I'm not uh, complicating the scheduler. So I'm going to walk through this now. Here's the general flow given the program. We're going to consider code a region at a time, like I said. I'm going to look at this data flow graph of my entire program and calculate some weights on that data flow graph. And we're going to go and partition up and create these fine grained threads. So, oh, okay. so, again here we have all these nodes and we have some node weights. We have nodes are operations within this region or this block. So this is the trickiest part of my, my uh, presentation to understand. I just want you to remember, the only thing you need to remember is that node weight, it's a metric for the resource usages. And you'll see in two or three slides how it actually works. But the general concept is, if I have this add, and I'm going to execute it on this cluster, I'm going to figure out how many resources is it using up in a certain cycle. So obviously, if I have one adder on this cluster, it's going to have a node weight of one. It's using up the entire resource for one cycle. If I had two adders in this cluster, the node weight would be one half. Okay? So you'll see how this works on later on. And it's going to be used to estimate how overcommitted my resources are. So edge weight. So edges in the graph, they indicate data flow going between each of my operations. And what I he did here is, when you go to partition this graph, you're going to have some edges that have some very high weight between them. And that's going to indicate ones that you don't want to cut. You want to put low weight on edges that we're going to indicate to the partitioner, here's a good place for us to cut off and force some communication to create some uh, different threads. So what I did here is a, what I call a slack distribution method. So slack is a term in the compiler world I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, but if we assume infinite resources, how, how much that on each operation can move up and down in the schedule without increasing the schedule length. So anything on the critical path in the program has a slack of zero. What I did was I translated this notion of slack from operations down to edges. So here you see each of the numbers, the red numbers in this uh, graph indicate the edge slack. So the critical path has an edge slack of zero. And these other operations, the other edges have some amount of slack and they indicate how much up and down in the schedule I can move these operations. So what I do is here is we're going we're gonna to indicate to the partitioner that the critical path is something that we don't want to cut. So we're going to assign these, uh, these edges a high edge weight. Let's not cut these edges. And let's start progressing up along the uh, data flow graph. And let's indicate some edges that are good to cut. And this is slack distribution. We have some slack here. And the general idea is we want to break large chunks of operation off away from the critical path to execute in parallel. So we see that both of these edges have some amount of slack. What we're going to do is we're going to indicate that these have some low amount of slack. So here's a good place to cut. And it distributes slack by removing that amount from everything above it. So what I've done is I've propagated up, and I'm going to keep going up and removing that amount of slack away. And then I'm going to keep going, and anything remaining, giving it some edge slack, if we have some. So generally, the only difference was here is we have some with high and some with medium. The medium edge weights really only differentiate between something we know is critical on the critical path and something that became critical because we did some slack distribution on it. So the actual partitioning of the graph. As I said, this is a similar to a multi-level FM algorithm. And there's two different phases. First, we're going to coarsen the graph. 
And this is the hierarchical nature. We're going to group together operations where we want to consider them as a single unit. So what I try to do is a maximal matching of the graph of based on the edge weights. So anything with a high weight edge, we're going to give preference to group it together. So we're going to course in the graph by grouping and continually grouping. And what you can think of is at every step, we're going to take a snapshot of the system. So this, these, this, anything at that point is considered as a single unit. We're going to keep grouping until we get to the same point where we have the same number of clusters, uh, number of groups as we do clusters. We're going to go ahead and assign these to certain clusters. And at this point, the refinement stage is going to happen. During refinement, we're going to kind of backtrack through each of these stages. And at every stage, anything that was in a unit at that time, we're only going to consider it as a unit. So generally, there's three questions you want to answer. Given this current partitioning of blue operations and green operations, how good is it? The second thing is, which of these two uh, groups should I try moving operations from? And finally, when I try to move something, how profitable is that? Is that a good move? So now we're going to get back into those node weights, and we'll show you how that works. So given this partitioning here, we see in the middle of this slide are a cycle by cycle account of those operations. And what I've done is I attributed its node weight, which if you remember is its a estimate for its resource usages, across its scheduling range. So 1, 2, 3, 8, 12, and 14 are on the critical path. So there's one specific cycle where I hope, I expect them to execute in. So they're attributing their entire node weight to that cycle. 4, 5, 6, and 9, they have some slack amount with them. And they're, the width you can see is kind of indicating how much of their weight they're attributing to that cycle. And they're spreading it up across multiple cycles. And I've done the same thing for cluster 2. So what we can do here is we can sum up across each cycle and see that every case, because of the way I formulated the node weights, we have an idea of how much overcommitted a, uh, a cluster is per cycle. Uh, based, and we can see is that cluster 1 here, overall we have five uh, cycles more worth of work assigned to that uh, than that we actually than we have the resources to support. We can do the same calculation for cluster 2. And obviously, in this case, cluster 1 has more operations and it's more overloaded. So what we're going to do at this point is, if you look back at the graph, we're going to refine. We're going to jump back through that stage. And now we're going to look through, given these groups of operations at this time, where can we move operations from to? So here we're going to say, let's see, let's see what happens when we move 4, 5, 6, and 9 from cluster 1 down to cluster 2. We'll transfer their operations down. And we'll recalculate this schedule estimate for the uh, operations. Um, what you see is that, although it might not be obvious here, this is actually a slightly better partition of the operations. We've slightly balanced the resource usages. And what, we, what the partitioner would do is it would go ahead and make this move. It would continue trying moves while it, while it sees anything profitable. And it doesn't see anything profitable at this point. So what happens is it uncourses again. And, I, and I'm going to skip those animations. But it would basically keep going and going until every operation can move around. Yes? So on the requirement stage, um, is there a bound on the um, total number of sub subgraphs that you have to consider, and do you consider all combinations or ready? Uh, what, what was your so experience? there's no bound on the number that can move. So at every stage of the refinement process, what we're going to do is try to move operations from the more imbalanced one to the less imbalanced one, and these groups can only move once per stage of the coarsening. So that way, I don't you know, keep moving things back and forth. And the other thing is, so once something is moved, it's moved. It's moved for that iter for that so stage. I find the optimal subset of things. No. To move. Okay. But it, the next phase, where it un uncoarsens again, it could start moving things back. And the other thing is, in order to not fall into local minima, we actually do 
keep moving operations while, while the overall benefit is positive. And so that, that, that just avoids the local minima case. Um, so. What? That does make uphill moves? Yes. Comes out with worse schedules at times? Yes. Um, but I, I always revert back to the best one that I've seen at the very end. So, so general idea behind this computation partitioning. I've improved over local algorithms. And here you see a graph of my improvement over uh, the bug algorithm, which was the original it's a, uh, computation partitioning algorithm. It's very... Uh, widely used. And you see five bars here. The first two indicate a two-cluster system. So, the, And the very first bar I actually do worse than bug, slightly worse. This is because this is a two-cluster system with one ALU per cluster. This is a very limited system. So actually having a global, uh, having a local uh, decision making doesn't hurt you at all. But as you can see, as you go to uh, more and more sophisticated systems with two ALUs per cluster, and then four, uh, four different clusters, you see the power of having a region view of the code. Now you can have a better partition of your entire code. Um, and the very last bar is a, another interesting thing. What I, so from the ground up, I built my system to handle heterogeneous cores. So this is actually a heterogeneous core. We have four clusters. Only three of them actually had ALUs. And I was able to support that, and I could actually do better than a local system because I, be I can have a better understanding of the underlying resources. So that just is the computation. And the natural question is, how are we going to deal with that pre-bound data? So earlier on, I talked about how we partition that data. So the, the very easy thing to do here is we just take all of those decisions that we made on the data operations and bind them down into the clusters and make that computation partitioning understand where memory accesses are. So it knows where the data is going to be. So we start out with some partitioning of uh, the memory, ac op memory operations. And then we're going to go through and do our normal coarsening and refinement and moving operations back and forth. But what you see here is that when we go to refine this code, we're not going to try to move the stores from the blue to the green or the loads from the green to the blue because we understand where they are. And the computation partitioning can understand that. So let's get down to the bottom line. How much fine-grained parallelism can we actually pull out? So here you see a graph of my speed up over a single core. So the red line, which is 1.0, indicates running this application on just a single core and the performance of that. So each of these benchmarks have three bars. And the first one is more or less a random data partition. Here I'm doing as good of a computation partition as I can, assuming a shared memory. So it doesn't understand the underlying partition data caches. The middle bar is what I'm doing. I'm intelligently partitioning the data, and then I'm part intelligently partitioning the computation to create these fine-grained threads uh, knowing everything about the, the caches and resources. The final bar is what I call the unified system. So this gives you kind of an idea of the upper bound. So the final bar is also a single core machine, but I've doubled the resources. So I have twice as many functional units, twice the cache size. So it gives you an idea of how much fine-grained parallelism is actually available in these applications. So you see some benchmarks like line screen and GSM encode here, I'm doing quite well. There's, for line screen, there's almost perfect amount of parallelism. We can almost get 2.0 uh, speed up going from one to two cores. And my having a good data partition, I'm at about a 1.9x speed up, which is quite good. And it, it also shows you the value of having a good data partition. Not knowing what the data was only about a 1.4x speed up, which is not bad. but you can get significantly better if you understand the data caches. Not surprisingly, the spec benchmarks I didn't do so great at. So the spec benchmarks, you'll see they have very low amounts of parallelism. And even in one case, MCF, I actually even lost performance. Um, and what this is, gives you an idea of is this has very low amount of parallelism. And what I'm trying to do in this case is I end up trying to force parallelism 
when none is available. So I ended up slightly decreasing my performance. And what this tells you is that my, my, my scheme isn't infallible. We have to carefully choose when we want to extract fine grained parallelism. But on average, what we see is that there's over all these benchmarks, there's about a 1.5x speed average speed up that we can achieve with an intelligent data partition. I'm about a one, almost a 1.4x, 1.3, 3.5x speed up. Yeah. Are there are there ways that you can detect the partition algorithm that you're in one of these situations where you're converting yourself into spot? I haven't found one so far, but that, that's a good question. Um, generally, if you have an idea, if you can just generally, I, I uh, no, I can't think of it. It's more of a characteristic of the program. If it's more straight line code, and you don't see many cases where you can push things across, I guess that would be a general case. Um, but no, I haven't found anything. So. Overall, my research summary. What I've tried to show you here today is how I'm exploiting fine-grained parallelism across distributed resources. And this is through two methods. One is data partitioning, where I'm effectively using these caches to reduce coherence overhead and reduce memory stall time. The other is computation partitioning, where I'm trying to evenly distribute these operations across the different clusters and bring operations close to the data. So I'd like to spend the last four slides talking about where I see things going in the future. So obviously, we're going to see more and more cores on a chip. And we're going to see upwards of 100 cores on a chip. So I started in the architecture community, actually. And you'll hear a lot of talk now recently about architecture research is dead. People are saying there's no going to be no more architecture research. People are just going to stamp out more cores on a chip. Now, I don't really believe that. I really believe that things are just moving in a different uh, dimension. So one way things are going to have to be changed in the architecture community is this interconnection between the cores. They're already rapidly moving that way. How do we connect all these cores together? And also, when we have hundreds of cores on a chip, if we have hundreds of data caches, how are they going to connect together? You won't be able to convince me that we can have a coherence network that can scale to 100 different cores across an entire chip. That's just not going to happen. And one other way which I really believe things are going to change is heterogeneous and specialized cores. So when Intel and AMD both have their 100 core processors, they're still going to need to differentiate from each other in certain ways. And one way will be specializing cores. And we can specialize in a lot of ways. We can specialize in terms of power and having certain cores be uh, high power very fast and certain cores be slower and but low power. We specialize in terms of capabilities. Uh, we can have specialized cores for to do certain tasks. And you're already seeing some of this with the AMD and ATI fusion. What they're talking about is bringing a lot of the graphic capability onto the same chip. But we're going to go back to the same issue. How do we best exploit this parallelism? And the answer is obviously parallel programming. But parallel programming has been a big problem in our industry since you know, before I was born. It's always a problem then. It's still a problem now. It's, been a, it's always been a hard problem. The difference is, back then, it was more of an esoteric thing, or only those people working on very difficult, high-performance computing things really cared about parallel programming. And now it's moved on to we have multi-cores on our desktop. Everybody needs to figure needs parallel programming to be easier. So, why is this programming parallel programming problem hard? So, there's a difference between sequential programming and parallel programming. So, we think of traditionally when we program sequentially, the programmer is writing the application, and the programmer really only has to worry about correctness. Am I is this program executing correctly? And all the performance details are really left to the hardware and I'll include hard compiler in the hardware. So these are things like instruction scheduling, out of order execution, and things like that. I mean, the programmer has to worry about performance at an algorithmic level, but those low level details are all left to the hardware and compiler. Well, what's happened with parallel programming is it's kind of like the floodgates between these two have opened. Even to achieve correctness, the programmer has to understand the underlying hardware 
and understand these differences between uh, how things are being shared and so, so forth. Similarly, the hardware and compiler, in order to achieve performance, they were relying on the programmer to specify some parallelism. So what I see is there are actually two big problems. One is identifying when we have parallel opportunities in our code. Second problem, although related but it's different, is given these parallel, pro parallel code portions, how do we actually take those and map them to the hardware? So what I really see happening in the future is more of a multi-core compilation system like this. The programmer really only has one problem. We want to define parallelism. And this can be through threads and th or through transactions or whatever parallel programming model we end up coming up with. We're going to leave it to the, the compiler to more focus on how do we take this and push it, to the, push it to the hardware. So the compiler here has a hardware spec. It understands underneath how many cores I have and how that, how that hardware is uh, set up. And it can actually do the management of the parallelism. So here I see the output of this is more of a coarse parallel program. And then I see more of what I talked about today. So I think in the future when we have hundreds of cores, we can rely on the programmer to specify lots of this coarse grain parallelism. Whether we can ask them to specify hundreds of cores worth of parallelism, that's an issue. But if they can specify some of those and then fine grain parallelism can further use more cores to further gain performance, that'd be a wonderful situation. And finally, we'd end up with a situation, a final, final program, which is paralyzed across all the cores. So I have actually one example of this situation where I developed something where it fits into this model very perfectly. And I did this hybrid transactional memory model, which I did at uh, Intel. So briefly, there's actually two different ways a lot of people have been playing with transactional memory. One is totally in hardware. So when you have hardware, you write things into a transactional cache, and you have all these transactional contexts. Now, th this is fast, but you're limited by how many of these transactional contexts you can keep. Software transactional memory is a slower method that uh, is wholly done in software and doesn't rely on having any hardware at all. But it's more scalable. You can go to many, many transactions and not see any performance uh, degradation. So my hybrid technique kind of leveraged the benefits of both. So within the software model, we allowed the hardware transactional memory to take place. So the hardware, so you could actually use the hardware underlying transactional hardware and switch between the two. You could switch from being in a hardware mode to be in software mode. So you can see this fits into my scheme very well because the programmer really only has to worry about one thing, defining the transactions. This is where transactions start, and this is where transactions end. The compiler or the hardware is more focused on how should we run these? Should they be in hardware mode? Should they be in software mode? This can be dependent on a lot of runtime things, like how many transactions are actually in the system right now, how many things are being aborted in the system, and so forth. So the key here is we're letting the compiler and the hardware decide the method. So my final slide. What I see is, in the future, more of a separation between definition of parallelism for the programmer and management of the parallelism uh, for the compiler or the hardware. And I think the compiler is a great place because the compiler has a deep understanding of what the underlying hardware is, and it can better manage all these threads and different transactions. So what I see as the major open issues going forward is that we still need to define this common coarse grain parallel programming model whether it's transactional memory, whether it's something else. As an industry, we really need to come up with a good parallel programming model. Um, and the more difficult tasks are when we have these parallel programmings within the programs, within the compiler, actually analyzing and proving the correctness of them is a difficult task. And the big one is how are we actually going to debug these. And that's, a, that's an open issue. And thank you for that. I'll take any other questions. I have another question. Sure. You talked about a, a heterogeneous course and mm -hmm. how that factored into this algorithm. Um, it's certainly possible to imagine a, a, a interconnect where the speeds between different cores are varying. Mm -hmm. 
How do you factor that into this? Oh, I haven't thought about that before. That's a good question. Um, so actually, that within my system, that could actually work out. The functionality is not there, but basically, we do model whenever we're trying to figure out when we should move operations back and forth. We have an understanding of, um, actually, that would work right now. We have an understanding of, to get from one cluster or core to another one, how long that takes. And that is modeled into making our decisions. So if, if, it, if one took a longer time, it could actually understand that placing things on different uh, cores would make a difference. Yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah, so using, this is all about data locality, right? Making decisions based on. Sure. So the data partition, yes. So profile guided optimization has been around for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. Although it seems like what I've seen is a lot of it's based on code flow. Mm -hmm. Data locality. Mm -hmm. Is this? Have you thought at all about the, um, the, other, the code flow and how it plays in with data locality at all? Uh, not really. I've been mo mostly focused. So I really wanted to do everything statically, if possible. So I was more doing when I did the most of the partitioning. I was doing statically, but I kind of moved at the end, just recently, to more of a profile method, and that was more focused on the data partition. But. Um, I think you could still build up some some information that would be useful with that. I'm not I'm not sure right now. <laughs> I have to think about it. Um, what about the objects who don't have fixed memory location, like an automatic garbage collection? How does that affect this? Mm. So our case doesn't have anything like that, like any kind of garbage collection case. Um, so you're saying if it doesn't have a fixed memory location. So again, my profile more is building up relationships. So if you have memory addresses, I don't care about what actual memory location it's accessing. I more care about whether different operations are often accessing the same uh, same objects or, or parts of substructures. So yes. So I, since I'm only building up uh, general relationships, I'm kind of pushing those together. Obviously, if you had some kind of, you could have some varying behavior there. Um, what I've seen in general is that our profile, you're able to do a good job of actually just generating small relationships between, local relationships between operations. And I actually keep a small uh, window in order to keep my uh, decisions pretty local. So over a large course, I could see it, things varying. but. I think in general you can pull up pretty good information. Can you give a short overview of the Trimaran system? <laughs> Basically, what languages are you trying to target a little bit sure. of the hardware model? So, so Trimaran is a research compiler that's been evolved over a long period of time. So I actually started, it's actually, there are three main components. One is the impact compiler, which is more of our front end. And this was done at the University of Illinois. Um, actually by my advisor and his advisor. And the, the back end of it is C, and C, uh, yes. And, uh, and we can, uh, we do handle Fortran, but it's more mostly through a Fortran to C pr process. Um, the back end is called Elcor, and this was done at HP Labs. And it was originally done more as an Itanium compiler. So we kind of started more in this uh, VLIW and EPIC domain. And the third part is our simulation environment, uh, which was done at another place at Georgia Tech and NYU, I believe. Um, so recently, we've kind of been pushing it more towards the embedded design space. So we have a lot of multi-cluster support. And that's where a lot of my research has started. Um, so was it, there anything else here? So if I look at the instruction stream that go into different clusters, mm -hmm. they're basically kind of cycle-dependent on yes. yes. So. I think what you're getting at is running things out of order. Is that what you're saying? Or? No, I'm just trying to figure out what's the model. Yes. So it's it's right now you think it's more of like a VLIW, so things are synchronized or running in lockstep. And you see that model scaling? Uh, in the embedded design space, that's definitely going to stay. In the more general purpose, it's not. That's, there's a reason why Itanium has failed, right? Um, but 
I think my techniques, what I'm trying to do here more is show that we can pull out this parallelism. Whether the underlying execution of those is running in lockstep or running with some synchronization method between them, it's another issue, I think. So. Couple things. Um, so, you know, partitioning data flow graphs, mm -hmm. you know, there's a large file you work back in the 80s with functional languages and things like that. Yeah. So, can you talk at all about how, you know, your algorithm here is advantages or disadvantages to that body of work that was done back then? Or? So, I'm not too familiar with the functional programming work. Um, so, there was, there was work done on data locality, and, mm -hmm. you know. So, I think what I'm and like that. more focused on is this very, very fine grained notion at the operation and actually at the memory the memory operation level of partitioning things up across. So I can't really say specifically because I'm not sure about the specifics of these functional programming language things off the top of my head. Um, a lot of data flow too, right? A lot yeah. of data flow machines in the 80s. They had basically Yeah, so they're, they're doing a lot of the similar things of pulling things out. Um, so what I would say is that those a lot of those programs then had a lot of parallelism very obvious to us. It was much easier to parallelize, as far as I remember. So a lot of my cases, it's very hard to actually figure out where you want to split operations across different um, cores or clusters. And my techniques are very, very able to, very good at looking at very specific parts of the code and mapping those down to the different hardware. Okay. And, and another one? general question. Uh, um, so, you know, the HPC world has been, you know, trying to take sure. parallel programs, sure. decompose them, map them on the process sure. with, you know, memory modules, which seems very similar to taking a, you know, in the HPC world you have processors and memory modules. Here you have, you know, cores and mm -hmm. caches, right? Sure. So, in a sense, the architectures at a high level are fairly similar, similar, right? Yeah. I mean, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between mm -hmm. many components. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the HPC world has not been particularly successful in automating any of that. Mm -hmm. um, do you see some reason that the, the multi-core world will be better at this than, or have more success than I the HPC say, world? I would say in the HPC, HPC world, they, they in, more in the past, they've been more working on finding more core screen methods to come up with larger things we can parallelize. They haven't looked at such a fine-grained level. And what I'm seeing is more I'm just advocating a fact that we need to look different ways, in different ways for us to more paralyze our programs. Um, yeah, they're, they're most of the, many of the HPC programs themselves are very, very parallel, just the very basic nature. Um, but de yeah, detecting that parallelism at a high level is hard. But I say at a fine green level, it actually, actually might be a little bit easier. So a lot of them in the past have been trying to figure out where should we actually paralyze these large threads? And actually doing that is, might be easier, I would say, for the programmer to do and for the compiler to analyze. But this fine grain method, you can look at a small region of the code and figure out better ways in which we could paralyze. And I think, I would say my work is applicable to the HPC world, too, um, because you can still paralyze across these different cores that they have and, uh, and get similar benefits, I think. I think it's mostly a question of the constants involved, right? It's a question of the weight of your computation versus mm -hmm. the interconnect move, if you will, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah, a lot of the HPC world, I would say, also, they have a slower interconnect, I think, between the operations. Yeah, but they're doing more work, though. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, for the grains so work. So this is why it's more correspondent. Right, so, mm -hmm. but why isn't it easier? I mean, it should be easier to find, you know, large blocks of code that are coarse grain, right, than it is to find. And if you could do that, I would absolutely advocate that. I'm just saying that we can also paralyze in different ways. And we can look at, look at things from different perspectives. And there's other ways we can achieve performance benefits. You think of it as HPC is loosely coupled courses. When the course of grain you have, if, if you're analyzing dependencies, the course of grains you have, unless you have a programming, programming interaction to actually produce the interdependencies and have a loosely coupled system, the course of your grain is the more dependencies you're going to have, and the harder it's going to be to sort of tear it apart. So you have to get involved at the algorithmic level and define mm -hmm. a loosely coupled system. So it seems that 
logical, at least, that at the fine grain level, we would have an easier part, easier part or an automatic partition. Seems like I can build up coarse grain. So if I can identify the parallelism at the fine grain level, I can build it up into coarse grain, right? I mean, that's in a sense what he was I can, doing, I can right? Thing, I can so, see things going that way, too. You know, why hasn't the HPC community been able to do that? <laughs> Any other question? I was waiting for him to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a problem. I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure if we'll be any more successful on yeah. these, you know, many core systems that... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, a lot of the algorithms and, and things he was showing there were shown in, back in the 80s on data flow graphs, you know, at the same mm -hmm. level, pluses and minuses, divides and things like that. And, you know, finding that parallelism and building it up into grains that, that were success, you know, successfully executed on, on processes was found to be a pretty tough problem, right? And, you know, I mean, it had some success, but I wouldn't say it was tremendously successful. I'm not sure if we've changed. What I'm saying is, I'm not sure if we've actually changed the problem. You know, right? No, but some of the some of the commercial environment has changed too, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I think there's a there's hope that the applications are different. Mm -hmm. The application spaces are different, right? I mean, the benchmarks he was using there would not have been the ones you have seen in an HPC yeah. talk, right? So the hope, if there is a hope, I think, is in the application space, right? These applications targeted for, mm -hmm. you know, a many core chip or many core processor are significantly different in character than what's, you know, what the HPC yeah. world I does. think the difference is that... there is that maybe that'll yeah, and, and make these more years successful. Ago, when, when Dataflow was, or 25 years ago, when Dataflow was hot, you know, video encoding wasn't you know, mm -hmm. a central problem. But it was, right, that, that's right. The application space is different. And, and, and now we're hoping, seeing... You know, that's what I was hoping would be the answer. <laughs> and we're seeing a lot of these, pro these processors now on our desktop. Before, it was only this small group of people looking at it, and more commonplace applications are going to be more applicable. Right, so. right. So the application space is different. Now. That's the hope. Right? Okay. I think there's more to that. I mean, just if you think about the techniques that we've seen employed here, uh, you know, if you, if you consider about what what does a coarse grain computation look like in terms of what we've seen here, <coughs> sorry, what visibility does a compiler have into some uh, trace that contains uh, millions of instructions? Uh, some uh, this, you know, dynamic dispatch. No, but the functional language work and the data flow work didn't, I mean, there they weren't so interested in doing, you know, these coarse grain, you know, distributed, maybe like, you know, I mean, the data flow work from the 80s was all concentrated on, you know, fine grain threads and things like that and building those up into, you know, sequential sequences like you had and moving things around so that they would execute on the right processors and things like that. And so that was a very fine grain view of, the, of, a, of whatever the application was. Right. But did they have the interconnect on the same chip? And maybe, maybe. Well, they assumed more of a PRAM model when they were doing things, so they were in connection with. Implicitly, yeah, implicitly, right. right. And the data flow processors had, you know, embedded networks, right? Okay. Thank you. Very Thank much. you.